hold us down because it didn't hold him down. Right. Glory to God. Hallelujah. He's alive this day. Praise God. Amen. Amen. He's alive forevermore. Amen. Glory to God. He's helping us today. Oh, glory to God. He sent that Holy Ghost power so that Hallelujah. we can know that there is quickening power. Glory. There is the power of the Holy Ghost to help us to come out of here yes, when He comes for us. Yes, Praise yes. God. We can be here walking on the earth or we can be in the grave, but it's going to be quickened. Hallelujah. That old uh, mortal body that's in that grave is going to be quickened. And this old mortal body that's walking around in this life is going to be quickened and we're going up out of here. Come on. Oh, with Him. Oh, glory to God. He's that first fruit Woo! <laughs> of the resurrection. Oh, glory. He rose from the dead and we're going to do it too. Hallelujah. He started us rising from the dead when He gave us new life. Hallelujah. When He let us have a brand new life. Oh, glory to God. We were made new creatures. We became new. Hallelujah. We were resurrected from that dead condition we were in all our lives. And oh, He's going to do it completely. A complete resurrection for our lives. Oh, glory to God. I love Him to say. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, the world don't want to even look at it. They don't even want to look at it. They gotta have an Easter bunny. They gotta have all that stuff that goes around it. Because they don't want to look at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Come on. They don't want to see. Hallelujah, that it had a happy ending. Come on. But when it does, not only for him, but for us. Hallelujah. We go through this life not knowing which way to turn. A lot of times. But when that resurrection, hallelujah, trumpet sounds, glory to God, it don't matter which way we turn here, there, and there. It don't matter. We're turning up and we're going up. Come hallelujah. On. We're going to be there with Him. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you for being alive this morning. Thank you for rising from the dead. Yeah. Thank you for, hallelujah, showing yourself strong in our behalf to help us, Lord, to feel that resurrection power of each Lord. Glory, 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 glory to God. We're not dead. We're not we dead. We're alive. Jesus. We oh, we're alive forevermore. Hallelujah. Oh, praise God. Hallelujah. Oh, praise God. Hallelujah. It makes the devil mad when he can't keep us down. He wants to. He wants to keep us down. He wants to keep us worried and fearful. But I'm going to tell you this. God's got power to help us all the way. Because if He gave us that assurance when He raised Jesus from the dead. Didn't He? He gave us that wonderful assurance. Oh, hallelujah. That blessed assurance. Thank you, Jesus. Ain't no grave. I'm going to hold my body down. Hallelujah. Praise God. I want us to pray this morning. We always do, but let's pray about everything. And let's believe that the Lord is hearing and answering. So how many of you have a very special unspoken request you'd like for the Lord to meet? Ooh, many, many, most. God knows it, doesn't he? Hallelujah. Now, how many of you have a spoken request that you need to say? You need to say. It's important. Gloria. Do you know how he is? We already prayed. We prayed and then we're going to pray again. But next time find out. Okay? See if you can find out. Because we like to know if we can keep on praying. Nehemiah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, praise God. Thank you. 
I hope that he'll perceive you. I told him. Good. Hallelujah. Pray for Daniel that God will save him. Dan God's got his hand on Daniel when he was a boy. He got all his teddy bears together, just like that song about the teddy bear revival. Well, he really did it. Uh, put them on um, in front of him, and he had the laundry basket for his pulpit. <laughs> and he preached. So pray for Daniel God that God will come back. Somebody else? Olivia Bryan today. Somebody else? Okay, Jesus. Let's remember. Yeah. Yes, remember Brother Hanson. He's got shoulders are hurting and his arm hands are hurting him. And uh, his heart is hindered his sleep. That would be really, really pray for you. God will heal that. Um, praise the Lord. Somebody else? Anybody else? Thank you, Jesus. Remember, um, Tammy's friend Sandy that is um, not sure what all of going on it's not cancer, but she's going to church this morning. Pray that the Lord would touch her, save her together. And, um, also, I want to thank the Lord. We saw Sister Cherie while we were up in Augusta, and she and I had an opportunity to really seek the Lord and pray. And um, she had something that was really hurting her, and uh, we prayed for it. And while we were praying, it began hurting severely, and we kept praying and praying, and um, she felt it move and go away. And when she got home, things were well, and the Lord just touched her. So I thank the Lord for that. But um, just remember her, that the Lord would encourage her. She doesn't have a church up there with her church. And that the Lord would continue to uh, move and uh, minister to her family and family needs to be saved. Amen. Let's pray for all of our church out there. Right. <laughs> there are lots of people that we are their church. Right. And uh, Sister Glad for uh, Sister Johnny Hong is having surgery. Yes, she needs prayer. Uh, she's very faithful to our church. And pray that the Lord would see her through that surgery, heal her body, help her, strengthen and encourage her. Hallelujah. Anybody else? Yes, yes. Sister Shorty has surgery. Yes, it was a morning. It was an eight. Morning. So, oh, so Shorty sure had it. Did you hear it? Not, not, not yet. Okay. Her finger was completely black, so I'm not sure what they're going to have to do, but they're not sure if it's concerned. And then we're just going to hospital today. We're going to trust the Lord for it. Somebody else? Yes. Remember my brother and sisters and Michael's brothers and sisters that God was saying to the other ones. Remember Heidi that we're ministering to also for the music from she desperately needs to be delivered and desperately needs salvation. Mm -hmm. Remember Sister Teresa. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sister Angela. Mm -hmm. Appreciate all of them. Hallelujah. I have three friends <coughs> that I made through Facebook. I'd like y'all to remember. Just my three friends if you will. Anything else? Thank you. 
being that um, <coughs> it's Easter Sunday, normally we talk about the resurrection of Jesus. I'm going to talk this morning about the death of Jesus. Because the resurrection wasn't possible without him dying. Right? I mean, that was something that had to happen. And because that happened, that's what made forgiveness possible. And that's what we're going to talk about. If you turn in John chapter 19, we're going to look there. And maybe I'm just asking this question to myself, but when have you been frustrated with your inability to fix something? Have you ever, right? I heard laughter. So, have you ever had something that was broke and you're like, oh, I could just fix that. And just, no matter what you tried or how you manipulated it or anything else, it just wouldn't get fixed. I remember when I used to fix computers back in West Palm Beach years and years ago. They bring in a printer or a monitor or something. And I would there would be a little something wrong with it. Well, by the end of the day, it was worse off than when it started. I mean, I ended up, you know, backwards on the thing, and instead of fixing it, it was more broken at the end of the day. And there were just days like that. When you were trying to fix something, every once in a while, it would just become more broken. So finally, my boss is like, if you ever have one of those days, just don't do anything. Just find some paperwork to do or something else. Don't try to fix anything on that day. Just come back the next day, and it'll all start working again. I mean, we used, we were fixing personal computers, and we used to joke that it was because they called them that because every every machine had its own personality. All right, it would just be obstinate or cooperative or just however it felt like being that particular day. Um, and you also feel really good, though, when you do fix something. And I think part of what we're trying to talk about here is the death of Christ allowed him to help us fix ourselves, to fix our sin condition. And going through this, he, he made that ability for us to be forgiven, which is really an impossible thing. But He made it available. He made it accessible for us. People, people use the word love in a lot of ways, but this type of love is way beyond. When, when we can be in such a sinful condition and God loves us anyway, in spite of ourselves, to the point where he would have his son to die for our sin. That's love. And he sent his son to bear the punishment that we deserve for those sins. And we're look at um, his um, ultimately he he overcame death in the grave, but prior to that, of course, he had to go through the process of the, the judging by Pilate and, and the Romans. And we're going to look into that a little bit. So if you turn to nine, John 19, starting in verse 8. We're going to see how even through all of this, Jesus didn't leave a single thing undone that needed to be done. And Pilate therefore heard that saying. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was more the more afraid. And went again into the judgment hall and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speaketh thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. So Jesus, and he was teaching at the Passover meal, and then it was interrupted by his arrest in, in the garden, and then 
He was up in front of some Jewish leaders, and then the next thing you know, he's before the Roman governor. That's Pontius Pilate. So he was he was the Roman governor over there. He became the, the governor about 26 AD, so he'd been the governor for about um, roughly seven or eight years, is what we figure. But his relationship with the Jews had been very rocky. He didn't get along with them. He, he tended to even look for ways to offend the Jews. He didn't really like them. And that the turmoil that was going on in Jerusalem, especially around the preaching of Jesus and all the things that were going on, didn't really um, didn't really create him a favored attitude for Rome, right? Because he was the Roman emperor, and he's like, you know, what's what's this governor in Jerusalem doing? There's all this craziness down there. I mean, there's no confidence in him as the governor. So he was really he didn't like them, but he didn't he didn't want to create a stir. He didn't want to make a, a big riot happen over this. Which is why he ended up going because at first he said, I find no fault in this thing. You know, see you unto it. But then later, they just kept coming back to him. Because he, he felt, if, if this is, if they ever, the, the Jews were blaming Jesus for blaspheming God. Bless you. And, and so to Pilate, that wasn't an infraction against Roman law at all. Blaspheming God had nothing to do with the Romans. Right? They were Gentiles. They had nothing to do with the Romans had everything to do with the religious part of it, which that was the Jews. So he's like, hey Jews, take care of this. This is a religious matter. It's not a government matter. Why are you at the governor's seat? So the whole dispute over the the, Juda the Judaic law and, and, and getting involved in all that was the last thing Pilate wanted. He didn't want to be anywhere near that conversation. So to kind of close the case, he permits Jesus to be beaten and humiliated in a hope to pacify the Jewish leaders. Here, I'll do this. Now, go peaceably and leave me alone. And don't get me in trouble with the Roman Emperor. Basically what he said. The religious leaders just kept going on and going on. Saying, he blasphemed, claiming to be God's son. And that's what he said in verse 7. And when, well, when Pilate heard that, that's what they're talking about in verse 8. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, that, that Jesus was claiming to be the son of God, he was the more afraid. What was he afraid of? Why would he be afraid? The Romans and their pagan beliefs believe that the gods would come to earth in human forms. Right? Think about Greek mythology and that. A lot of them would come down and interact with the humans. They would take human form and do things on the earth. Also, his wife, Pilate's wife, had warned him that she was shown not to fool with this whole matter. That God had shown her and warned her about it. It's in Matthew 27 and 19. So, so the fear of a big, real riot over this was always in the back of Pilate's mind. He didn't, he didn't want to kill a man that was not worthy of death. And he was even more afraid when this mystery man said he was the son of God. And, and to Pilate and his belief system, that was a good reality because he really believed that the gods came to earth in human form. The Jews didn't believe that. Right? 
because it never happened before. But in the in the Roman area, and that's why he asked him. He said, "Whence art thou? Where did you come from?" I mean, the Jews claim that he could come from heaven, and he claims to be from heaven. And Pilate wanted to know if there was anything to that. Are you really a God? I mean, he really wanted to know. But Jesus didn't answer him, not a word. And Jesus was quiet over the whole matter. He gave him no response at all. So here the Jews are screaming at Pilate about all the things he did, and then Jesus is just sitting in the corner. And he's not saying nothing. He's not answering for himself. He's getting the silent treatment. You ever get the silent treatment? Somebody? From one of your children, maybe? They just don't say anything. My mother used to say, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. So you know what? i just be quiet because I couldn't say something nice. So, so through that, Pilate tries a different strategy. And whether he was frustrated by Jesus' silence or just really maybe he wanted to remind him who was really in charge, he decides to uh, exert his power as governor. And he said, he said, you know, I have the power to release you and I can also crucify you. I mean, I hold your life in my hand. It was a battle of wills. It was Pilate's will. And then Jesus' will, but it was really Jesus doing the will of the Father. But Jesus was steadfast. He didn't, he wasn't going to change. And this was really a prophecy of Isaiah, too, right? It was, you know, the lamb was done before this the slaughter, right? It was so there was there was other things going on here. Um, look at Isaiah fifty three and seven. Isaiah fifty three and seven. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet. He opened not his mouth. He has brought his lamb to the slaughter as a sheep before shears is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. Remember, we studied before this part of Isaiah is talking about the Messiah. He's talking about him 700 years, almost 750 years before the crucifixion. So Pilate had given Jesus a choice. You know, if you confess this, I'll, I'll let you go. If you cooperate, I'll let you go. Or you can keep refusing to answer and then face the consequences for it. Who's in charge? Well, Pilate was trying to establish who was in charge of this situation. Pilate thought it was him. Pilate thought it was him. The Jews thought it was them. But Jesus, you and I know it was the Father who was really in trouble. And it shows because he gave word to Isaiah 750 years earlier about exactly how this was going to go down. So God was in charge of the whole thing. And we see evidence in these verses that God was in control. And Jesus tells him that he would have no, he, the governor Pilate, would have no power at all except that God permitted him to have power and authority over Jesus. God allows human leaders to exercise authority, but in the end, God maintains the ultimate control of the situation. By 
calling out the one who had no true authority, Jesus placed himself in the hands of the one that holds all of the authority. God's purpose and timing was set in place every step of the way for Jesus' life, for his ministry, for his death, and then ultimately, which we'll talk about later, his resurrection. And then tonight, what I want to talk about is how all of that becomes critically important to us. All of those events, his life, his ministry, his death, and his resurrection. And how it's functionally important that we understand and believe that. God had no intention of stopping his plan that he'd been planning for thousands of years for this moment. He wasn't going to let Pilate do something that was contrary to that plan. Pilate thought he was in control. Pilate was not in control. We sometimes think we're in control. Guess what, people? We're not in control. Right? And the sooner we give control... He said those bumper stickers, God is my co-pilot. Remember that? I hated those. I wanted to be the pilot. I don't want to be the pilot. I want him to be the pilot. Right? I want to be God's co-pilot. Maybe that's a better way to bumper sticker. Hey, we should do that. Let's put that on the bumper sticker. And even then, I'd rather just ride in the back of the plane. Everybody else do all the work, right? I want to be last. Not even second. Right? Let somebody else be second. The ultimate prisoner became the ultimate judge in the situation. Jesus, although he was the prisoner, he was the one that had laid this out. Jesus declared that the Jews who had handed him over to Pilate had a greater sin than the Romans who would carry out the execution because they were the accusers. Right? The Romans, they were just a tool to get what the Jews needed done because the Jews couldn't kill them. And now the Jews, they would kill you by stoning. Remember? Over and over, that's how they killed you. Stoning The Romans used crucifixion as their tool. And then in the middle of this is Caiaphas. Caiaphas was the high priest. And along with the Sanhedrin, they are the ones with the greater sin that Jesus is talking about there in, in verse 11. And they should have recognized that Jesus was the Messiah. For all the things that was done and demonstrated and accomplished and foretold and predestined and prophesied about in Isaiah and other places in Jeremiah, the Jews in the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees and the high priests certainly should have recognized that from the scriptures, this is what's going to happen. You know, obeyed from Nazareth, from a virgin birth, from, I mean, it's all there. I mean, we can see it now. Right? We're looking back 2,000 years and we've got all this history and we've got the whole New Testament to glean from. And Paul's teachings and they, at this point in time Paul wasn't converted, right? So they didn't have any of those teachings and that stuff. We have more knowledge now than they had then. But certainly Caiaphas and the high priest and the Sanhedrin who were the, the, the leaders of the Jewish religion should have recognized but instead they abused their power. They abused their spiritual authority. They condemned someone that was there to save them. So by sending Jesus to the Romans to be executed, Caiaphas actually had the greater sin or the more serious judgment. And the Jews were playing on Pilate's fear of Rome and the retribution of that because he was already on iffy ground as his governor. He was probably pretty certain that 
Rome was going to get him out of there if he didn't get things sorted out or peaceable. And they, they probably told him, well, no friend of Caesar would release a guy like Jesus. They would paint him into a corner. And Pilate had to get into that. So in verse 16, the second part, it says, And they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of the skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others other with him, one on either side and Jesus in the midst. Pilate sentenced Jesus to die, probably on a charge of treason against Rome, which wasn't true, right? It was really about blaspheming God. And that second half of verse 16 just says that he handed him over. They took Jesus and led him away. He didn't say anything else about it. They were the Roman soldiers, right? The ones that were assigned to the tools of the execution, which was crucifixion, the preference. But first, there's other accounts in Matthew and Mark where they whipped him, whipped him terribly. And a lot of that was done, the belief is, for humiliation, for one, but also to weaken Christ's body. Right? Because, again, Pilate didn't want to have to kill him. So Pilate gave an order to beat him severely so that he would die quickly on the cross. That was the intent weakened his body. And, and the Romans did the crucifixions in public places. Um, and it wasn't as much um, as a show, but more of, well, I guess it was a show. It was really a sign of them. Um, it was a public humiliation type of thing. And they, they wanted onlookers. Because what they wanted was other people to see. You see what happens when you get in trouble with the Romans? That happens. You want that? Well, you got to straighten up. You ever say that to your kids? You want other women like that? You got to straighten up. It was to keep people in line, and that's why they they left. Sometimes they leave the bodies up on the cross. Now the um, the Jews wouldn't crucify anybody. Jews wouldn't crucify them. The Bible in, uh, I think it's Deuteronomy, says that, um, I think it's 21, anyway, sorry, flashback, um, that anyone who hangs on a tree is accursed. So they wouldn't, they wouldn't want to do that. But there was physical and emotional, emotional and spiritual pain associated with going to the cross. So the physical, the emotional because everybody's watching, and then the spiritual because it's just the humiliating. It's humiliating to them. You had to be a really, really bad person to do that. And then a part of that humiliation was that bearing of the cross. And then I know in, in the pictures of the stories and the plays and all that, they have him taking the whole cross. Um, and a lot of times it was just the cross. So the pole would be at the site wherever they were going to crucify him. At. And then it would just have the cross piece where the arms or hands would be nailed. That's what he would be carrying. You know, it would just be a beam. Right? And then he'd get to the site and then they put him. And, and sometimes on there, I don't think you have any pictures of him, but, but usually have them like really up high. But if you look in the history, it's actually a lot lower than you think. I mean, you can probably just reach up and touch his feet. It's only a few feet off the ground. It's always neat. It didn't have to be 10 feet in the air. They said to be high enough, high enough off the ground that their feet, feet didn't touch the ground. There's a couple of things I learned as I was studying through this. But that, that, that degradation, the humiliation of the 
beatings and carrying that beam through the town to where you're going to be crucified and killed. But to Christ, it wasn't the tool of death that he was carrying. It was a tool that would open the door to life. It would open the gateway to eternal glory. And the place on that site of that hill was the place of a skull. The Aramaic name was Golgotha. But there's also a Latin word, which is Calvary, which is where we get the word Calvary. So that's the Latin translation of that Hebrew word Golgotha. I was wondering where that came. Calvary. And John was very simple about what happened when they got there. He just said they crucified him. He didn't go into the great details. Some of the others talk about the great pains and details. Just one has a book that really describes the actual physical pain that somebody would suffer from crucifixion. How the body responds to it, how the lungs it's just awful an awful, awful thing to talk about. So John, again, John was the one who Jesus loved, right? <laughs> he was the one leaning over on Jesus all the time. And so he just kept it simple and said, they crucified him. But the original audience of the book of John would have understood the pain that was involved in crucifixion. I mean, they'd seen firsthand what it did to a person. They understood. And Jesus was not executed alone. Right? He was in the midst of two other crosses. And John doesn't say anything more about the men, but the others, Matthew and Mark, talk about them as thieves or violent revolutionaries. Someone who did evil. And then one of those criminals in Luke uh, commentary right his gospel says that the one criminal joined the spectators in taunting Jesus while the other one came to the Lord's defense and the Lord asked him for forgiveness and Jesus gave him forgiveness after he had been beaten severely after he drugged this beam through the town to get outside the city to Golgotha he still forgave a sin. That's the way Jesus is. That's the way Jesus loves. And even Isaiah, back in chapter 53, um, verse 12, and I will make... Oh, 53 and 12. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great shall divide the spoil with the strong because he hath poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors and he bare the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. 750 years before all this happened. And Isaiah is saying he's numbered with the transgressors. What does it say there at the end? And he made intercession for the transgressors. How did Isaiah know that Jesus was going to take that man, that second criminal, and forgive his sin? Isaiah said all about it. That amazes me about the Bible. That amazes me about how it is laid out and absolutely fits together. Those types of connections and correlations that are almost 800 years apart and they happen exactly the way they were predicted or prophesied. That's amazing. That's God. No only God could do that. I was thinking the other night, I was reading about the children of Israel wandering for 40 years. I thought, 40 years, how long is that? It's a long time when you really sit down and think about it. Just be wandering around a desert. In the same clothes. Right? The Bible says they had the same clothes as the day they left Egypt, 40 years later. How about you? I don't fit into my clothes 40 years later. 
<laughs> 40 months later, 40 days later, he was numbered among the sinners. And the thing we need to remember is there was a purpose for all this. And I know Sister Lynn is going to preach on this later, but he paid the price for what we couldn't pay. Remember we talked about that? And, and that sacrifice opened the door for us to be saved. Without that action, after the sin in the garden, there was no way to get that back unless something was sacrificed that had no sin. And everyone that was born in a normal way was born into a life of sin. It's just the way nature made it. Way, it just came that way. And the only way for that to happen was to be able to have someone born of a virgin birth, the way Jesus was. That was the only way to have the ability to have someone be similar because they had to be basically God in man form. They had to be the Son of God. It was the only way that he could live a whole life 33 and whatever years in a sinless condition. No one else has ever done it. No one else probably ever will do it. We should try. I'm not saying don't try. In verse 28 it says, After this, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel of vinegar, and they filled it, filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it on his sock, and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished, and he bowed his head, and he gave up the ghost. And normally crucifixions could take six, nine, sometimes even twelve hours before someone actually died. Oh, it was terrible. But it says in the other scriptures that the sixth hour is the ninth hour. So he was only up there for three hours. That was mercy. That was partly probably because of the deed. And before they had um, offered him, um, well, first they they had um, the soldiers had um, gambled for Jesus' clothing and they made wagers and cast lots for his clothing. And again, that's from Psalm 22 and 18. I mean, all that's predicted hundreds of years before. Right down to every detail. It's just amazing. Jesus also made arrangements for his mother. And he tells John, you know, behold my mother. John adopted Jesus' mother, basically, to take care of her. Brother John, did you ever wonder why that Jesus did that because you know there were other sons besides Jesus, Mary had other sons and daughters. Why did Jesus say behold my mother? Well the other thing that's interesting that I thought of was John was the only apostle that was named that was at the cross. Right? right? I mean none of the others there's some of the women Mary, Mary Magdalene. But John's the only one that was named. And then he had already um, he said he was thirsty, which <clears throat> once, once he knew that all things were being, being completed, he was kind of showing everybody that, you know, he was still human. Right? Because a God wouldn't be thirsty. Right? Jesus was demonstrating his humanity. He said so they had this jar of vinegar. And the idea behind that was earlier they had, um, Jesus had rejected a drink. And it was probably because the drink that was offered was a sedative. They would they would give him wine mixed with myrrh, 
which would be an ascendant type of thing, almost like a, kind of like morphine. Yeah, kind of take the edge off. So and they would drink that, and then they would, they would you know, they tell you not to take certain medicines with alcohol, okay? Because it would accelerate the medicine. So it's kind of like that. Like he refused it there. He said, no, I, I need to suffer for that, right? And, and it would give you short relief in the short in the short term. It would give you some relief. But in the long run, it also relax you to where you'd be in more agony for a longer period of time, right? So, but it didn't prolong his life. And a hyssop branch, I looked this up, it, it's actually a fairly short tree branch. And they're not, it's not a long limb or anything on a hyssop tree. It's just fairly short branches. But what they think is it was actually a spear or a javelin that, that was used to put the sponge on. It was made out of the trunk of a hyssop tree. Obviously, you wouldn't take a whole tree up to it. But the branches on the tree are very short, so it's kind of hard to... If it wasn't that high off the ground, it would have worked, right? But it didn't need to be that long of a pole. But he takes that vinegar as sort of his final act before he says, it is finished. And then some people refer that it was a finish to Jesus' physical suffering. But it also could be more like a shot, a shot of triumph because this, this has been a plan. Jesus was involved in the planning of this six thousand years before, right? I mean, he he knew what was going to happen. He had executed and completed his father's mission to perfection. He didn't sin his entire lifetime, and then he was obedient unto death. He did what no other human could possibly do, and and for our benefit, what no human will ever have to do in the future, right? He died once for all. Nothing else is necessary for our redemption, and, and that that brings us hope. That gives us a hopeful feeling when we know that Jesus finished everything that we need. Right? We don't have to do anything else except believe. Right? We have to take it to heart. And the, and when you think back to Adam and Eve, I just got a minute here. Yeah. <clears throat> they were in a perfect community with God. Like they had the greatest relationship with God of all mankind. Right? They come and walk in the garden with them in the cool of the day. And, right? What a life. And then they messed it all up. Satan messed it all up. And they placed their desires above God's desires. They didn't believe that God was the ultimate authority. And when they did that, they brought sin into a world that had known no sin. But God wanted to help us to understand how serious sin really is. And how damaging it is on our relationship with Him. Remember last week I said, our sin creates that gap between us and the Father. And the only thing that closes that gap is our reconciliation back to the Father, back to the paths of righteousness. So when Jesus said, it is finished, His death was that sacrifice for that sin. His death was the bridge that covers that gap, gives us access to the Father. Before Jesus died, there was no bridge. Nothing slain animal, but then Jesus was slain once for all. And then John says he gave up the ghost. And Jesus really demonstrated his, his authority over all things. 
Nobody took his life from him. Jesus laid it down on his own voluntarily. Jesus determined the moment of his death. The Jews may have instigated it, and the Romans may have charged with carrying it out, but in the end, Jesus was in control of his life and his death at the very end, and ultimately, his resurrection on the third day. So everything that happened was exactly according to God's plan. There was nothing left uncovered. It was finished. And God takes this, we call it Good Friday. It's kind of a mis- I mean, is it a misnomer? We say Good Friday because Jesus was killed. Right? It doesn't sound like a really good day for Jesus. Right? But it was a great day for us. Right? Because he can't rise on Sunday morning if he wasn't killed on Friday. Right? I mean, that's the thing. God took that darkest chapter in human history that Friday and turned it into the best thing. A good thing. Because Friday, as dark as it was, wasn't the end of the story. Sunday's on the way. Now Sunday's here. And then Sister Linda's going to talk about the rest of the story, as they say in the radio show, right? But what do we need to do? If, if, if his death and his sacrifice covers the sins of the world, what should we do? Offer forgiveness, right? Look, look and find someone in your life that has wronged you. Reach out to them. Right? Jesus died, and what did he do right before he died? He forgave the thief on the cross. Did he know him? No. He had, I mean, he did, he did because he was Jesus, right? <laughs> and he knew all things, but he never hung out with the man until he was hanging out with the man. Right? And all he said was, Will you forgive me? And Jesus said, Yeah. Just that simple. And it's working that way today. It works that way for you to go to Jesus and say, Jesus, forgive me. You know what he's going to say? Forgive me. And it works that way between us and other people. You walk up to us, you forgive me. That's all you have to do. And then you have to give thanks. You have to reflect on all the things that Jesus saved you from. You remember all the things? I mean, I always really remember all of them. But do you recollect the things that you did and mourned on and said and oh, terrible? You were awful people. But Jesus saved us from that. Saved us from ourselves. We need to thank Him for that. And then we need to share. We need to have people understand that that forgiveness, that salvation, that saving power is available to everyone through His death. It's available to everyone in the world from now and forever through His death. Because again, without Him dying, He can't rise. Without Good Friday, there is no Easter Sunday. Share that with somebody. Share that with everybody. Because it's critically important. I mean, he was he was accused, insulted, humiliated. But at the end, he's forgiven. In the end, he finished everything that needed to be finished. And today, because He resurrected, He's standing by for us in whatever we have need of. He's ready to do whatever we have need of. Right? He's still sacrificing today. Amen?
there in front of those beautiful flowers.
always sang it Easter time. He is risen. I love singing it with him. Hallelujah. Maybe he's singing it in heaven today.
Yeah. All right. Hallelujah. We're going to stop right there. And I got uh, something I want to tell you and from the Word. Hallelujah. Glad He is risen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I never loved reading or hearing a tragedy. <laughs> Tragedies have never been something that I really enjoyed. <laughs> Some people do, like think Shakespeare must have, because he wrote all kinds of them. But when I write a book, everybody in my book gets saved. They can't help it. I like a happy ending. <coughs> Hallelujah. I feel like God likes a happy ending, too. In fact, He plans a happy ending for every one of us, doesn't He? He loves to give happy endings. And today we're going to celebrate the happy ending. The ending of when Jesus was crucified, when they laid him in the tomb. Hallelujah. And three days later, he rose again. Hallelujah. Luke 24 and 13. I'd like y'all to turn there. Hallelujah. I want to just read one little... Uh, episode of what happened to Jesus after he rose from the dead. I thought it would be a good episode to read. I taught the children a lot of it, a lot of it in Sunday school. Some of you have to watch Sunday school later. Brother, we had a kind of a fix up on my Facebook yesterday and when my phone got back on it, it wasn't all right. <laughs> so Brother Jose always uses my phone to film the Sunday school and uh, it didn't work very well. <laughs> So if you didn't get to watch our Sunday school class this morning, how about watching it this afternoon if you'd like to? I love them for y'all to watch it with us and to comment. The children do too. Um, it's nice for them to have y'all watching, right, Gloria? Okay, in Luke chapter 24 and 13, he said, And behold, y'all can just keep your seats for this. I'm going to read down the ways. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Now, we want to talk about after Jesus was risen from the dead, I told the children that he went right straight, straight through the door without having to have it unlocked. And the reason was that Jesus, when he was raised from the dead, had a glorified body. His body was no longer just a human body as it was when he lived all those 33 years. He had a glorified body. And so when he drew near to them and went with them, the Bible says, but their eyes were holding that they should not know him. They didn't recognize him. And he said unto them, What manner of communication are these communications are these that you have one to another as you walk and are sad? And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem and hast not known the things which have come to pass there in those these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty indeed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished which were early at the sepulchre. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. They're telling him this like he's a stranger. <laughs> oh my. See, he's alive. They don't know who they're talking to, do they? 
Then he said unto them, O fools and slow heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Psalm 16 and 9, Psalm 22, Psalm 132 and 11, Isaiah 7 and 14, Isaiah 9 and 6, Isaiah 40 and 10, Isaiah 50 and 6, Isaiah chapter 53, Jeremiah 23 and 5, Jeremiah 33 and 14, Ezekiel 34 and 23, Ezekiel 37 and 25, Daniel 9 and 24, Micah 7 and 20, Malachi 3 and 1, Malachi 4 and 2, John 1 and 45. <laughs> He's telling them, this is all these things. He went through Moses and the prophets, expounding unto them the scriptures, and all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh unto the village whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with him. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and brake and gave to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him. And he vanished out of their sight. <laughs> wow. Wow. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn with us while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? Then they began to realize, really, what it meant to them for them to be talking to him, the resurrected Savior. Now, I've got news for all of us. We've never known anybody else but the resurrected Savior. All our lives, He's been the resurrected Savior. We've read about Him before He was resurrected. But right now, He's in this world, the resurrected Savior. The Spirit of Christ is here, abiding with us. The resurrected Savior, the one that is, has a glorified body. You know, He came to Paul, didn't He? Paul saw Him. Paul saw Him several times. Hallelujah. He appeared to Paul. Hallelujah. We can look now, today, at the resurrected Savior. And we can see what He can be to us. Instead of looking at Him like, well, He has the same limitations that we do. No, He does not. He can pass right through the walls. He can pass right into our presence anytime. He so sees fit. He can be with us. He can walk along with us on the road we're walking. Yes, He did go away. He is gone to the, and sitting at the right hand of the Father. But there are people that have seen Jesus since that time. Like Paul, for example. People, hallelujah, can at times be visited by the resurrected Savior. And many times we have felt the resurrected Savior in our church being with us. Hallelujah. <laughs> Anointing and helping us. Hallelujah. Praise God. In Acts 2 and 24, God wanted us to realize that even though Jesus, it was possible for Him to die, in verse 24 of chapter 2 he said, Him, or 23, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that He should be holden of it. It was not possible for Jesus Christ to be held by the pains of death. He would not be held by death. It was not possible for Him to be held. Yes, He died because He was human. But no, He did not stay dead because He was our Savior. 
Hallelujah. Malachi 4 and 2 tells about that Savior. A prophecy. But unto you that fear my name, Shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in His wings? And ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. If you fear the Lord's name, then the Son of Righteousness will arise with healing in His wings. The Lord is in you knowing and being helped by the resurrected Savior. The one that is not dead. He's alive. And He's alive forevermore. Glory to God. John said, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. That's why. Hallelujah. That's why you can believe in being baptized with the Holy Ghost. Because who's going to do it for you? It's going to be Jesus Christ, the resurrected Savior, with a glorified body that can do anything. Hallelujah. Those of you that are seeking the Holy Ghost, instead of saying, well, I just don't know how, I don't know what, I, it don't matter. If you don't know how or you don't know what, fasten your eyes on the resurrected Savior. Believe. The Bible says He breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. He can walk right in this church right now, Sister Barbara, and breathe on you. Wow! And say, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Wow! Hallelujah! Jesus can breathe on us, can He, Sister Annie? And take care of every need, everything we have wrong with us, anything we don't know which way to turn or what to do, Jesus, the resurrected Savior, can come in the midst of us and change it all. Hallelujah. He came in the midst of the, those disciples and though Thomas was doubting, 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 couldn't believe that Jesus had risen from the dead. He said, I'm, I want you to reach forth your hands and put them in my hands. Put your hands into my side. Be not faithless, but believing. Thomas didn't even do it. He didn't do it. He just said, my Lord and my God. He knew that Jesus was alive then. He wasn't, wasn't doubting anymore because he saw Him. And Jesus said, you believe because you've seen me. Blessed are they that, that believe and have not seen me. I haven't seen Him, brother. But I believe. And I believe He's risen from the dead. I believe He has a glorified body. I believe that He is so different now. He's been able to do for me everything I've ever needed for Him to do. Glory to God. He breathed on me. And I received the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. If you wonder where the Holy Ghost comes from, He comes from Jesus. Jesus is the one that comes to baptize you with the Holy Ghost. He said, it's expedient for you that I go away. <laughs> I need to die on the cross. I need to be risen from the dead. And I need to go away. Because I'm going to send you another comforter who will abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of the truth whom the world cannot receive. I'm going to send that Holy Ghost and He's going to be there with you. Because when I depart, I'll send Him to you. Who? Who will send Him to you? The resurrected Savior. The one that gave you new life to begin with. How are you saved? It's by Jesus' blood that He shed on the cross. And you are raised again by that resurrecting power that took a hold of Jesus and raised Him up from the grave. That's how you're a new creature. By that wonderful power that brought Jesus up from the grave, you've got that same power in your life. And when Jesus comes around, hallelujah, breathing on you, and saying, receive ye the Holy Ghost. You, you are going to receive the Holy Ghost. Right. Oh, glory. Because of His power. Oh, glory to God. 
Hallelujah. Jesus has all power in heaven and in earth. When he got up from that grave, that's what he told us. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. I don't know about you, but that devil will fight you looking to the resurrected Savior. He'll fight you to keep your mind off of him. Today, while we were singing those wonderful songs about him being risen, I looked at the faces and many of them were not focused in on what was going on. Wasn't focused in on this being Easter and Jesus being risen from the dead. Brother Don said it yesterday. He's been risen from the dead. We're celebrating it today. But He's been risen from the dead the whole time. Right. Our whole life. Right. He's been risen from the dead. He is a resurrected Savior. He is a resurrected Savior. The one that saved my soul had risen from the dead before He did it. The one that saved you. He's risen from the dead. He's been alive. He's been sitting at the right hand of the Father. Making intercession for us. And now He's here. He's here. Helping us. He said that not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. God wants us to focus on Him. Because when they were coming down from that Mount of Transfiguration, what did God say? He said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye Him. Hear ye Him. Pay attention to Him. Let Him show you things. Let Him guide you. He said He'd give us a prophet like Moses that would tell us what we needed to know. And that the people that heard Him would be saved, but the people that wouldn't listen to Him wouldn't. God wants you to listen to the resurrected Savior. He wants you to be willing, hallelujah, to serve a resurrected Savior. Serve one that has all power in heaven and in earth. To serve one that defeated death. Because He's given us power to defeat death. To overcome Hallelujah. To be that overcoming force in this world. Hallelujah. The enemy will try to get you down. Now I've got you trapped. Now you can't do anything for God. Oh, through the resurrected Savior, I can. Through Jesus and His power, I can do for you, Lord. I can be what you want me to be. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. It's not possible that Jesus could be holding down. Come on, man. It's not possible that Jesus could be holding down from de by death. He wasn't. He wasn't held down. And in Acts chapter twenty-six, he told Paul what he wanted him to do. He said, "I want you, but rise and stand upon my feet." For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. Is anybody in here do you know that Jesus has ever appeared to you? Anybody? You do? Has he ever appeared to you in person? Yeah, his face. Yeah. I'm talking about where you actually saw him. No. We know him. When he saved me that day, I knew he was in the ceiling of my mama's house. And I have sensed him other times. But like Paul saw him, I don't think so. I've ever seen that. But he told Paul, he told me, he said, You stand upon your feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. That tells me that if Jesus wants to appear, He can. If Jesus, the resurrected Savior, Sister Barbara, wants to appear in you, He can do it. Nothing can hold Him back because He said He has all power in heaven and in earth. 
And he told Paul, I've appeared to thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in which I will appear to thee. You know, the, those people that were walking to Emmaus, they said, did not our heart burn within us? Wasn't it wonderful when He was with us? Isn't it wonderful when He's with us? Isn't it wonderful to feel His Spirit and power as we worship God in the church? Isn't it wonderful? Oh, the devil hates it. He hates for us to shout and praise God. And it go all over the world. He hates that. He tries to stop it with all of his might. During the week, he's trying to mess with my mind. But I'm coming on. I'm going on. I'm praising God and I'm worshiping Him. And I'm trusting God for to see me through everything. He's making me a minister to say, my heart is burning within with the hatatano presence of Jesus Christ, the resurrected Savior living in me. It's burning with that power of a hatano holinimabasi. Yatatano holinimabasi. Yatatano holinimabasi. Yatatano holinimabasi. Yeah, I am a resurrected Savior with healing in my wings. I'm not afar off, but I am at hand. I will be found of thee if you will seek me with your whole heart. Be not afraid, for I have all power, and I will see you through every trial and every temptation. For I have won the victory and I will give it to you. Who oh, praise God. Hallelujah. Delivering thee, he told Paul, from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes to turn them from darkness to light. Jesus has power to open people's eyes. He has power to turn them from darkness to light. I was thinking of him right then, sister. Her husband. He has power to turn them from darkness to light. From the power of Satan unto God. That they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. He has power to turn people from Satan unto God. We, we wonder how much power does the Lord have when He said all power in heaven and in earth. How much power does the resurrected Savior have? He has power to do these things. He said, I'm going to send you to the Gentiles. They are going to have their eyes open." They are going to turn from the power of Satan to the power of God. They are going to receive, receive forgiveness of sins. And they are going to be able to receive inheritance among all of us which are sanctified. Sister, in this day and time, that is a wonderful promise, isn't it? Because if people could be sanctified, many people have asked Jesus to save them and are claiming Jesus' salvation, but never have they had the power to be sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost. But God sent Paul.
song by appearing to him that you're going to give them inheritance among the others that are sanctified. Give them power to be sanctified by faith that is in me. Jesus, hallelujah, our resurrected Savior. I want you to open your heart today. Even though you're saved, I want you to open your heart to the resurrected Savior. I want you to open your heart to all that He is. All that He is. All of His power. All that He can do to help you. All that He wants to do to help your heart to burn with Him talking to you and being with you. Oh, open your eyes. Recognize who He is. Understand I'm not just dealing with a normal, natural human being. I'm dealing with a resurrected Savior. I open my heart to you, dear Savior. I open my heart today to you being with all power.
Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. Somebody here needs to just open your heart. Say, come on in, Jesus. Come on in, my resurrected Savior, and take over. Oh, glory to God. Come on in. Be my everything. Be my power to live. My power to go on. My power to trust you. My power to do what you would have me to do. Glory. Be my power, Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And my life is worth living just.